I'm Dr. Ted Reed. I believe that everyone is here for a panel entitled Role of Therapist, Role of Client. It's my privilege to introduce the distinguished panel. On your left, doc, starting from your left, Dr. Rolla May. Virginia Satir. Dr. Carl Rogers. And Dr. Thomas Saz. Our panel will begin with Dr. May. Uh, I uh, am sorry I can't see all my victims, but <clears throat> uh, these lights here seem to be more important. But <clears throat> should I talk more loudly? Now, I had a negative reaction to this word role. I don't think the therapist or the client have a role, um, and I think it it puts a uh, uh, it puts a cast on the therapeutic session that to me uh, would make sense on a stage, but does not make sense uh, in a uh, uh, when we are doing therapy. But I realized that what was meant was uh, what uh, how do we uh, react to the situation. Uh, how does the therapist relate to the situation and how does the client relate to it? Now, I think the role is not set by the therapist. Uh, the role varies. Uh, what I do in a given session uh, depends as much as I can, uh, can make it upon what the client needs, what he, uh, the way he relates to me, uh, and oftentimes when I am going to the door to let a uh, client in, uh, I take the ten minutes between sessions and I uh, then do telephone calls or whatever, I find myself, myself saying as I go to the door, the hell with it. Now what I mean is, the hell with everything else that has been in my mind. Uh, maybe I had a little quarrel with my wife beforehand this morning, or maybe something else happened, or maybe I heard some news over the phone that was upsetting. Uh, all of that I try as clearly as possible, as much as possible, to wipe out. Temporarily, I am there, a, a consciousness as we would say in existential terms, a consciousness uh, for, the, uh, for uh, the client, you might say, but I don't think that's really it, for the particular session uh, with this uh, uh, client. Now, the role then will vary uh, that I take, will, will vary a great deal. Uh, sometimes the uh, client comes in uh, suppose he comes in angry, uh, then I uh, uh, am uh, not what you would call sympathetic. I uh, uh, let him know by my attitude, not by what I say, but by my attitude, that I can be angry too. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, a, a uh, that we set, the client sets the uh, situation up. This is a situation of uh, two people who are now uh, standing uh, both in this particular mood. Now, it depends, as I say, the role that I would take would depend uh, almost entirely upon how I can empathize, how I can uh, 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 how I can uh, uh, be part of the telepathy, let us say, that goes on in 
I think, frankly, every good therapeutic session. Now, uh, perhaps that's enough uh, for me to say to start with, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, I will turn the microphone over to Virginia. I'm in the wrong, I'm are you alphabetically right? wrong. Oh, are you? Yes. Our next speaker will be Dr. Rogers. Like Rollo, I uh, found myself really turned off by the uh, title of this panel because it seems to me that um, it is not a role, it is a function. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't play and I don't want to play a role with my client. To me, it's um, one of the functions that I perform during the day, whether I'm getting my meal, going shopping, making love, reading a book, whatever. They are different functions, but they are all me carrying out different functions. And when I'm a therapist, I am me, but I am carrying out the function of a therapist. Uh, to me, that's a very receptive sort of function. I, uh, I want to be ready to receive the client with whatever he or she brings to this relationship. Um, I would like to be very acceptant of any feelings, whether they're similar to my own or not, to any values, whether they're similar to my own or not, to any description of actions, even though I might disapprove of the actions in terms of my value system. I want to make this a safe relationship in which the client can begin to explore and become himself or herself. I would like to make it safe by being so sensitively understanding of the client's inner world that uh, there is no barrier to further exploration on his or her part. Um, I want, I want to uh, make it clear that I am trying to understand. I want to make clear my intent. I want to make clear the degree to which I feel I do understand the, um, the sensitive areas within that world. Um, I feel that in that relationship, I develop a caring for the client so that I it makes a difference to me what my client does or feels or says or the actions that he or she performs. Um, I want it to be caring, I want it to be real, I want it to be very sensitively uh, understanding and empathic. Uh, I, uh, I want to let my intuition free to, to flow through the relationship. I want to create a situation in which um, there can be a directional flow of growth uh, on the part of the client, a place too where I can learn from my client. Uh, as far as the role of the client is concerned, that uh, I don't see as a role or indeed as a function. I feel that the client comes with a need and that need is what I want to uh, respond to. Um, I think that uh, probably that's about all that I will say as, as a means of introduction, except to make it very clear that uh, I want the client to feel this is his relationship, this is her relationship, this is, the, this is the client's time to use in the way that he or she uh, finds most profitable and I want to make that easy and secure so that any defenses tend to get lowered uh, the client feels that I am with him or her in the search uh, that they're making um, I think that's enough as an introductory statement thank you Virginia uh, I come with two handicaps right now I'm tired for one thing 
too many early mornings and late nights and too much magnificent stimulation. Uh, the other piece is I find it very hard to behave as though I'm in an interactional context when I can't see people. And I think that's, I, I want you to know that because on the tired side, you won't see me bloom so much and I don't want you to get wrong ideas about what's happening. And on the level of not being able to see you, I cannot get uh, clues, which I use so many. Carl couldn't do this caring and I can't either, neither can Rollo or Tom or anyone, unless you see, unless you see, okay, I hope somebody hears you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm making a point, it's a piece of reality here, but it's also another, uh, another piece, which is that we are responding always to clues. I just like to um, give a picture, and I like to think of that word that was put in this uh, um, program role, to think of it as terms of expectations, um, about what expectations I might have of myself, what expectations I might have with whomever it is that I'm going to make some kind of a contract with. Now, the context in which I work so much of the time now is not with just another person, but with several other persons. So the first thing that I think about is that as I am interacting with someone, there are a whole lot of other someones that are taking their cues from what will happen to them whether or not the context can be safe is going to be in terms of what people see me in relation to someone else doing. That's one of the things I'm very clear about. That's both a model and a source of either confidence, trust, or concern. So that of myself, then, as a therapist, I expect myself to be seen as some kind of a model from which people are going to take their clues about what will happen, the same way we did as children, where we took our clues from the things that were present in relation to our parents that they didn't always necessarily say. Also, as a, um, uh, as a therapist, I expect to create a situation in which there, are, there is an equality of the meaning of our value to each other, but we have to delineate the function. I'm going to be the leader of the change process, but I am not going to be the leader of the people in that process. That is a very important thing. This is not just, uh, a, for me anyway, therapy is not a place where things just waggle all around, but it is a place where I am in charge of the therapeutic process, but not of the people that are involved. That always happens, I mean, that what the people do is in relation to what fits for them. And I think this is a very important thing. I used to not know this so well, and I didn't know what I was supposed to be in charge of. And when I figured out that I was supposed to be in charge of the treatment process, then it was much more possible for me to create freedom, which, is, which was important. Now, I said that I wanted to create a relationship of equality, meaning equality of value, that whoever is in front of me uh, is of value in the same way that I am. And so the important question is how can I be a leader of the process without at the same time being intimidating or controlling? That's a question that many leaders face and I see a psychotherapist as a leader. What I do with that um, is I check how does this come off to you? And I know that so many of the people that come to me have had experiences in control in their growing up so that they're both wanting to get validation from me and also will probably put the fears on me that they had somewhere else. So I am very quick and frequently ask, well, how does this feel? When I ask you this, how did it feel? When I did this, what did it feel like? And to, to be able to check back, because I learned now, and I guess I learned it some time ago, I'm not smart enough to figure out without checking what's going on. <clears throat> And so that is also a piece of the modeling. Now, as far as the person who are coming in and are asking for my services, of course, they would tell me what they expect and I would ask them. Then it would be important to find out if what they're expecting I can do. For instance, if a woman comes in and says to me, <clears throat> she wants me to help her cure her alcoholic husband, I say, I cannot do that. I don't know how to do that. 
All that I can work with is her responses to that man, but I cannot do anything about his alcoholism. So one of the things I try to be clear about is that what it's someone asking of me is I really can do. And people can ask anything. And at, at this point in time, I can say to myself, and then I say openly whether I can or cannot do that, whatever that might be. Uh, so the, the, my, I assist the people that are coming in to be clear about what it is that they want. And then, as I said, I ask, I ask myself, can I do something like that? All right. Now, in addition to, to having a continuing dialogue about how things are coming up, I am also willing to take risks in the behalf of the, of the person. Someone, for instance, who tells me that they, know, they don't get along with people and they would like to change that and I believe them, one of the risks that I have to take with them is to also look at them when they feel they're not getting along with me or I'm not getting along with them. And to risk asking the questions or going into areas where, um, where, where we're sh I'm stretching a little bit. And I make it possible, or at least I try to make it possible for people to expect that I'm gonna take those risks. However, there is also one other thing. And that is when I really reach a clear no, and I know that that's a boundary beyond which I cannot go, that is an occasion for celebration. Because I work with people in terms of being able to develop their freedom to comment, their freedom to take a risk, their freedom to stand on their own two feet, and their freedom to share openly what it is that they want, and also to be able to have experiences in hearing my yeses and my noes in a clear kind of fashion. So that's the kind of context that I work in. And once that's established, then we go anywhere we can go. And I've been in very many peculiar places. Thank you. Dr. Sass? Thank you. Uh, I have uh, interpreted the title of this panel a little more literally, perhaps, as some of my colleagues as going really to the very heart of our enterprise. Uh, that is what the role of the client and the role of the therapist in the sense of, as uh, it has been said, as f role as function, or uh, is even plainer terms, of what do these participants actually do? What do they actually do? And that really requires, as I see it, not only abstractions in terms of intent, but specific uh, doings or actions. So if you forgive me, I'll be uh, a little more concrete. Uh, and also, I would, I interpreted uh, the assignment as really being somewhat more dual, not only asking what we do as panelists, as therapists and clients, but, but more generally, what is the role of the client and therapist in the mental health field? Now, I will do all of that in about five minutes. <laughs> now, what I do, uh, it seems to me the first thing I do is that I think of this as I, uh, and I feel apologetic because no one so far has talked this way, I sell something and I collect money. And no one comes to me who doesn't pay money. Now that seems to be somehow not a nice thing to say because very few people talk about money. But everybody who comes to me has to pay money. Now. For this, I do certain things which I would best characterize as promises. I make certain promises to deliver certain things, to do certain things, and not to do certain things. And both of these are very important, and this I wouldn't d dream going into because this would take a long time. But in other words, as I see my own role, I promise to do certain things, and what I promise I do, and I promise not to do certain things, and what I promise not to do, I don't do. And by and large, what I expect of the client is very much in line with what Rollo May said. That really depends pretty much on what the client wants. My model sort of is uh, playing tennis. If you're a good tennis player, if you're a tennis pro, well, you're going to hit the ball depending on how the other person hits the ball to you. That's your job. Now, more generally though, what are the roles of uh, therapist uh, and client in our uh, enterprise? But I think it would be only fair to point out that uh, the role uh, of the therapist, to concentrate on the role of the therapist, 
because there are a number of identifiable things in terms of the history of psychotherapy that therapists have expected of clients and therefore to that extent they have put them in that role and, cl and clients historically have obviously fulfilled this well going beyond the first one and that is of paying money uh, which I would think has to be mentioned. The second role would be is to validate the role of the therapist as a good person. That is, what therapists want is adulation, positive transference, love. Thirdly, what they want is followers. <laughs> Our field is full of various sects, Freudians, Jungians, Rankians, Reichians, Frommians, transactionalist, rational emotive, reality, the English language is not big enough to fill it. Now, if this isn't what the therapist wanted, I don't think the patients, the clients, could themselves dream up these roles themselves. <laughs> Fourthly, they want what parents want. They want to reproduce their own kind, because as soon <laughs> as, as soon as soon as a therapist becomes any good, first thing he does is found a school and makes more of his own. <laughs> so they are in the reproduction business. Mul <laughs> multiply, like it, like, like it says in the Bible. Now some of them want even more interesting things. Some of them want complete confidence even if you don't know who they are like the original Freudians you must tell me everything you must free associate as if that were possible then some of some others want regression like the Mary Barnes story you should paint pictures and feces and then I am a great therapist because I write a book about you well there are other things they want. Some of them, for example, want the client to be hypnotized. Others want them to go through certain hoops, which they call tasks, that they send them home with. Now, it seems to me these are the various things they want. I have not even mentioned uh, the various other things which therapists may play roles and, and uh, patients, uh, which really seems quite embarrassing because probably the most frequent role, perhaps not by this panel is to give drugs. I mean, isn't that what mental health workers do? And it seems to me that many mental health workers who can't give drugs are unhappy that they can't and they only wish they could. So it seems to me, and I will end, that the roles of the therapist and the clients are the things which therapists and clients do and you hardly need any of us to tell you what they are because if you look around, you know what they are. What they do. Thank you. Is there a discussion? Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I would like to say a couple of things that I thought of in the meantime. Uh, <laughs> I find it very important at the beginning of a series of uh, therapeutic sessions that the client state what his aims are, the three or four things that he hopes uh, to get. Um, and these I are, these are write down so that uh, it's very clear to both of us. Now, it isn't necessarily that that will be the way the therapy goes. But it always gives us some reference point. We can go back to that later uh, when the, as the therapy goes along and, uh, um, and remind the client that uh, he had hoped to, uh, this was one of his aims. And then secondly, and these may seem, some of these may seem minor points to you, but I think they're really important. I don't find it good to sit behind a desk or, or any kind of, uh, of uh, physical impediment. And also, I don't think it's good, in my practice at least, that, I, that we sit directly facing each other. Because what we want is that this client can, as much as possible, be himself, um, to use a cliche, 
much as possible to be what he is, to express what he feels. Um, and uh, as uh, Carl so well put it, uh, the uh, empathy, I think, is the central issue always in uh, individual psychotherapy. Uh, and to the extent that, that uh, I can arrange things, the physical things, say chairs or whatever, um, then uh, uh, so much uh, the better. Now there will be a great deal of what Freud called transference. I would prefer to call it uh, relationship, feelings of relationship. And these are am uh, amazingly powerful. As Virginia was saying, uh, there not only is uh, transference from parents to you, but there's a great deal more that uh, it's, it's the way the client sees the world. And I want as much as possible to arrange things in myself uh, so that he will or she will be able to be as uh, uh, open in this world, uh, what Virginia was calling as uh, free in it. Uh, <clears throat> I guess these are all I had to add. Did you notice, did you notice how you all responded when Dr. Saz talked? Did you notice? Okay. See, I think there's something that's very important in this panel for what that means. And I don't know what you meant, but I'll take a crack at what, what was happening with me when I was smiling and when I wanted to pinch him and different things like that. Um, is that one of the things in the whole therapeutic process is that we suspect it. And I think sometimes there are good reasons for suspecting it. Um, part of, for me, is that um, we all come into a therapist uh, state, at least I think we do, as first human beings, and not always human beings that are fully conscious of what we're doing. I think we oftentimes are conscious of the hopes that we have. I know I try to be. Every once in a while I find myself um, into something that doesn't fit what I either intend or what I think is helpful. I've, I've given myself permission when, I, when that happens to me to allow myself to say so and to not feel that the last error is made, but I think it's part of what happened. Therapy is a human experience and I think we have to look at it as such. Paragons of virtue, as far as I know, do not exist, except in people's heads. And so to be able to be open when you fall on your face, when you, um, when you don't know, and also what Tom was talking about in terms of this is also a financial thing, because we have to live. However, I have some questions when, because I think therapy is probably one of the only professions in the world that isn't like plumbing. There is something beyond the money, or if it isn't beyond the money, I think we probably are in trouble. However, the money is also important. But I, um, I have spent a lot of time in my life looking at both myself and in the therapy training that I do about what makes an honest, helpful relationship between a person who is labeled I have the license, I have whatever it is, to lead a change process and for the person that is on the other end or the family members that are on the other end. And I think it's a crucial, serious problem that we, what, that we need to look at. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't want to um, shift this too much, but several years ago I got a request from a doctoral student at New York University asking me uh, what was my experience in sexual intercourse with my patients? And it was not a tongue-in-cheek thesis. It was a bona fide thesis. I couldn't believe what I heard, what I was asked to respond. I don't go in for that kind of stuff. And then also, but then I realized that there may be some people who did. And I felt that that was a form of exploitation. And I think, I don't know, you wanna, might want to talk about this, Tom, some a little bit, but I think you were also talking to the point of exploitation. Yes. And that's something that I think is very important to realize. And then later on, I found that there were some therapists who were beating up on their patients. 
And I wondered about that. And I, I remember one time I asked one about it and they said, well, I asked the person who got beaten, not by the therapist, what happened for you? And the person said, well, I learned how to take pain without dying. And one of the hard things for me is that almost anything that anybody does may help somebody someplace. And so I think we have an ethics question. I think we have an information question. I think we have an intent question in this whole thing about the therapeutic interaction. And, and, I, and I, um, I, I think some of you must have been looking at that in some kind of way when I heard the gallows laughter that came. Thank you. I like very much what Virginia had to say. I only want to add a few things uh, to what I said earlier. I feel that I am responsible to my client, but I'm very careful not to be responsible for my client. I want to create a situation in which the client can make sensible choices in the directions that he or she wants to move. Uh, it's been mentioned, Virginia mentioned that she checks with the client. That's very important to me. I feel I am a companion to the client in the search for inner meanings, inner conflicts, deeper understandings. And I want to be, I want the client to know that I am a companion right alongside. So I continually check my understanding. Is it this way in you? Is this what you're feeling? Uh, and it's that checking which is the major kind of response that I make. Then um, I think that um, one of the things that is more true of me and perhaps uh, the others here too is that I work as much with groups, as I, more with groups these days than I do with individuals. But the same kind of principles apply to the relationship. I want to make it a relationship in which it is safe. Um, and frequently I am very aware of my own inadequacies in trying to understand, in trying to be patient enough, in trying to be intuitive enough to really get to the bottom of it. Uh, it interests me that in recent years I have been more and more silent as I deal with groups. I don't, I'm not nearly as active, yet somehow I can be there and be with the, with the group and with the individuals in the group. Um, I also would add that I, I like the challenging way in which uh, Tom Zaz questions our, our uh, assumptions, our way of doing things. I like that. Dr. Saz. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I was listening very carefully all along, but especially when Virginia was talking uh, her second set of comments. And uh, I would only like to say this, I was listening not only with both my ears, but with our proverbial third ear. And I just want to say thank you to her. I completely agree. Uh, we try to be helpful and we try to be honest. Uh, but having said that, uh, we also have to make sure that we put all the cards on the table in our own heads and in conferences like this, uh, just what we are about. But thank you very much. It is the time when we will take questions from the floor. Go <laughs> out there. I'd like to yes. um, ask a question uh, over here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I have did. a question from the panel. Um, and that has to do with uh, the role of therapist and uh, versus the role of the patient. Do panel feel, or some of the members, or all of them, that uh, in order to understand the uh, role, uh, our role as a therapist, do panel think that it's necessary to be a patient at some point or not? In other words, is psychotherapy for psychotherapist is necessary? Is it helpful? Is it essential? Which one? Dr. May. 
Yeah, for me, I certainly would emphasize that very much. And the therapists I know are uh, people not who've got all their problems solved. If anybody thinks he has all his problems solved, you better start again at the beginning. Because as Jung puts it, we never have all our problems solved. And if we think we have, that's a sign that something is lost. Now, the therapist will have problems himself or herself. Um, these, so far as when I say the hell with it, I mean as far as possible. I want to put my concerns and problems aside. But I believe it's essential for the therapist to have had therapy himself. And uh, uh, I think many times we go back into it. We have a couple of consultations with a colleague. Uh, to keep ourselves as clear as possible uh, so we can listen, really listen to the client. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, mention that I've always been pleased with the pattern that we worked out at the Counseling Center of the University of Chicago. We certainly felt that it was helpful for people who've had therapy if they were going to do therapy uh, to experience what it's like to be on the, on the needy end of the relationship. But I don't believe in requiring therapy. Somehow that doesn't make sense to me. And I was pleased that over the years, we got to the point where every graduate student and intern who was going into therapy turned to some staff member for help before they completed their training. It wasn't required, but it was, but it was regarded as something that would be helpful. And when they felt the need, they were able to turn to any one of a fairly large staff to obtain help. That, I think, is useful too, to be able to uh, not just have one possible source of help, but to be able to select one's therapist from, from a group. Uh, I feel that that was quite an ideal situation. I haven't always been able to, to carry it out in the same way, but that, I think, uh, met the, the essential aspect that to be in therapy is very helpful in doing therapy but it should not be a requirement of a legalistic sort. Okay. Well, this, when this question came up, what I was thinking about, something I mentioned before, I cannot see my own back. And sometimes there are problems with it and I need somebody to help me. And I think that's also part of the modeling of your own awareness about when you need to have another pair of eyes, when you need to have help, and that you work it out in that way, whatever that might be. I don't think that the person you're working with is the one to do that, but there's a kind of a feeling about if you're practicing what you're preaching that is helpful to you. I think um, it, it certainly in working with a family, there are many times when especially new therapists meet the family they grew up in. They, they didn't plan it, but that's the way it was. And all the kinds of pains that were still unworked out come up. Well, that's a time in which I think it's important to know and to deal with that in some way. That could be dealt with in a formal therapeutic situation. It could be dealt with, as Carl was talking about, in a, in a training situation. It could be dealt with many ways. And I think the key about that is to be able, first of all, to know that there are times when we need to, to have help and to see what our back is. That's a metaphor for I can't see my back, you know. Somebody else has to tell me about it. Well, I think the time has come for me to fall back on my complaint that, or my contention that the very word therapist uh, is getting us into trouble, or at least is getting me into trouble in terms of trying to agree uh, with panelists with whom I spiritually and personally, I probably uh, otherwise am in much greater agreement than, than not. Uh, to answer the gentleman's question, uh, I think my answer would be a resounding no, and I'll tell you why. I see our enterprises having to do with coping with life. Now, it is, there is no question that people who have problems coping with their lives may find great help from consulting with others to cope with their lives better. 
But to me, the model is very close to an educational one. One certainly doesn't have to go to the Juilliard School of Music to be a Mozart. One doesn't have to go to school to learn something. One can read it in books. One can do what, to my mind, is the best way of doing psychotherapy, the F. Scott Fitzgerald model, looking at yourself in the mirror at 3 o'clock in the morning. And last but not least, and I really bring this up with some hesitation, uh, we constantly talk about therapy as something that will help us. Well, one of the greatest men on the face of this earth, who was not a psychotherapist, said something which has nothing to do with his business, and he said the following. A teacher can always teach you something, if not how to do something, or if not what is right, then how, to, how not to do something, what is wrong. The person who said this was Albert Einstein. And I think the world is full of people who have been to therapists and who have not profited from the experience. And that's why then they go to other therapists and other therapists and complain. So that I don't like the idea that somehow to solve a problem we should go to a therapist. It encourages dependency. It encourages the idea that there is something which one can't fix oneself. Now this is in no way denigrating therapy. In no way does it denigrate therapy. But when Carl said, I wouldn't require it, but it's a good idea, we are authorities. If we say it's a good idea, it's almost as good as requiring it. And you know very well that the great Freud, who kept talking about liberating patients, as soon as he had enough power, required the training analysis, which to me is intellectual and moral suicide of the highest order. And it has not been denounced in the literature of psychotherapy. Required psychoanalysis is an oxymoron. You cannot require somebody to submit to somebody, tell him your secrets, who will then betray you. The funnel of betrayal, Irving Goffman called it. Now, we, this is, we are skirting on this issue. No one on this panel, obviously, is advocating this. And I don't want to be misunderstood on this. But the idea that somehow we cannot fix our own existential problems, and by mean our own, I don't mean pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. I mean by going to the one true university, which Thomas Carlyle said is a collection of books. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, one word or process that seems to be uh, noticeably absent or avoided uh, in terms of its actual word is the word forgiveness in both the psychological literature as well as discussed among uh, clinicians or even here at the convention. And yet it seems that forgiveness is a basic phenomenon in the human therapeutic experience. This was most viv vividly uh, demonstrated in the movie Ordinary People where the therapist was able to facilitate the adolescent giving himself forgiveness for something that he felt he did that was, that was wrong, whether that was rational or irrational. Forgiveness has tended to be relegated to more religious circles, particularly within the Judeo-Christian framework. I'd like to ask uh, kind of a three-part question. Uh, what has been your current thinking, and perhaps how has your thinking evolved since maybe your early religious training uh, on the psychological credibility and necessity for experiencing forgiveness on a continuing basis for those behaviors that the client would identify as being wrong, uh, sinful, hurting other people. Not in that irrational, childish, legalistic sense, but someone who has a certain degree of sophistication and can get in touch with what, what's really going on. Secondly, uh, how critical do you believe that that is for mental health, for self-actualization, for experiencing contentment and fulfillment in life. And thirdly, uh, in terms of the particular topic this afternoon, to what extent do you feel that a therapist can facilitate that process and from whom should that forgiveness come from, whether that's from God, from a significant other, from themselves, or the, or the therapist? So the major topic is forgiveness, psychological credibility of it. Thank you. 
Do I have takers? <laughs> I like to I like to try that. <laughs> As I think this is a big is a big um, piece of something. I used to have women say to me often, "I wish I would have known what I know now, so I could have treated my kids better." And some of those were treating their kids pretty bad, like one woman who burned up two children in the furnace. Um, <clears throat> In my early days, I, I had a strong tendency to make things right. And I didn't think I was that successful to do it because one of the things that happens when something happens, there are scars. When real things happen, there's a difference between, as you, I think, indicated, between being neurotically involved with something you didn't do and really facing some things you did that were awful. Now, there are ways to make amends and all the rest of that. I've had occasion because I've worked with people who have done terrible things, murdered and all kinds of other things. And I don't know what other people's experiences have been, but I know that when I was able to allow myself to recognize there were some things which could never be undone and there were scars and we had to live with them. I cannot give anybody forgiveness. Um, that's not, I don't believe that's within my realm. What I can do is help the person to become, to develop for themselves um, how they're going to live with whatever it is that has happened, and hopefully to use this as a stepping stone for something else. Um, I spent many a sleepless night with, earlier with the feeling about the horror and also with the horror of trying to prevent certain things. And I guess my sober feeling at this point is that I'm not going to prevent what I would like to prevent. I can work at it. And I'm not in a position to forgive anybody and that we do bear the, scare, the scars of life. But like everything else, a scar can, over time, begin to be less noticeable and less nagging. And so that's where I am with that. That's a beautiful question, which I really think I also feel like wanting to say something about. And I think it brings out something very fundamental about what we do. And it also brings out the fact that we, do dif we are different people and we do things differently. And this does not necessarily mean that one is the right way of doing it and the other is the wrong. Uh, I found myself uh, in almost complete disagreement is what Virginia said, not at all intellectually, but in terms of what I do. Well, maybe you want to know what I do. If you, are, if you want to know what I do, I'll be glad to tell you now. I do uh, feel that it is quite appropriate for me to express forgiveness in the sense in which I heard the question. There is this person who is with me somehow wants to know what I think about what he has been doing. I'll tell him. But it's interesting the way you asked the question. Because I not only give forgiveness, but I also impose guilt. This person may be also telling me things which he thinks was quite okay. And I may throw up my hands in horror, and I say, my God, if you tell me much more, I think you better not come to me. Because I have my own moral values, and he's paying me so that he knows what they are. So I think, as I see it, forgiveness is quite a reasonable thing to do, but it's only one half of the story. So that's what I do. I think it is a crucial aspect of therapy. And I really see your three questions as one, because your second question of how this relates to therapy and self-actualization, I prefer also to throw in the term self-esteem. Obviously, people can't have self-esteem about themselves unless they feel that they are more or less good people. And that's what your question points to. And forgiveness, I think, is absolutely essential. That's why the organized religions probably have it over us, because they are in the business of forgiveness, and they know how to do this in a very decent, organized, historically validated way, and I don't think we should uh, minimize that. 
I would like to ask each of you if you consider what you do personally as therapists more of an art than a science or more of a science than an art and whether you think or what you think of that generally of therapists in our culture. Yes, I think what I do is more of an art. Now, I certainly hope I am scientific also, but uh, what goes on in a given session, uh, I think, is more art than science. That's a question that has been running around for a long time. And I suppose to the degree that I look at things and I weigh things and I come out with conclusions and I make hypotheses and so on, it's scientific. To the degree that, if I use a metaphor, I use the colors in the spectrum and I paint with whatever seems to fit, it's an art. And um, I don't know, uh, for the best for me is parts of things can be one thing and other parts can be something else. And to me, that's the best answer that I can come up with at this point. I've done in the past quite a lot of research on psychotherapy, and I'm <laughs> pleased that I have. But, and that's the scientist part of me uh, with which I'm pleased. But the scientist is not the person who enters the therapeutic hour for me. I'm not sure that it's an art, it's a human enterprise that to me is broader even than art or science. It's a, it's a human enterprise in which I'm engaged and that is quite separate from taking myself to one side and trying to look objectively at the recording of those interviews or the process that went on or the outcomes or whatever. Um, I like both, both aspects of that, but to me they are very separate aspects. I'm a human being when I enter the relationship. I'm a scientist when I look at it from the outside, looking at it in, in as objective a way as I can. But uh, for me, the two things are, are very separate and both very worthwhile. Uh, as I see it, uh, psychotherapy has nothing to do with science. Uh, it is art uh, in an empathetic, purely metaphoric sense. In my opinion, psychotherapy is applied secular ethics, unless one is a religious therapist, in which case it is applied religious ethics. But it is applied secular ethics, period, in my opinion. That's a category in which it belongs. Yes, uh, I guess I've been somewhat baffled over the last few days uh, with the evolution of psychotherapy is confusing me. Uh, I think in particular, uh, we talk about what responsibilities we have. My question is, where do the goals of psychotherapy come from? Is it, is it from the client? Is it, is it from us? How do we, and, I, and that's my first question. I guess the second question is, we all know what say a authentic person is, an existentially true person, a well-structured uh, ego state person, uh, whatever model we particularly want to choose from. Uh, how do we, for example, if we do rely solely on the client to come up with the goals, how do we prevent our own bias as to what is health and happiness? How do we prevent that from really laying that on the client? <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> no, I, I want to say something, but later. <laughs> I think you have two questions. There may be more. One is, how do you keep from using your own influence to raise the um, client in your own image and likeness? That's one of the things I feel that you're saying. And that's back to the old question of awareness and exploitation and all the rest that we started before. Sometimes you don't avoid it. Don't maybe mean it, but you don't avoid it. However, sometimes you, you do, you, you proselytize, that's another thing. <clears throat> another piece um, <clears throat> to this is that, for me anyway, I have a metaphor in my mind of a system uh, that, let's say a blood system, when it's clogged, 
it doesn't work right. And so if it's going to work right, it has to become unclogged. And one of the things for me is that if I look at trying to unclog something that is clogged up, I'm in less danger of putting my views on someone else. I take that view pretty much. That's, that's for me as a process model of helping to flow whatever needs to flow in the person so that um, uh, I can't imagine anyone who would uh, feel better when their arteries and veins were clogged up. So um, that's a different thing from whether they should eat one thing or another. Maybe that's also there too. So those are some of the considerations that I make in relation to that. I think you got something now too, haven't you? <laughs> well, I, yes, let me get this off my chest. Uh, <clears throat> I've been thinking a great deal during this hour about uh, the fact that you can learn a whole lot about therapy and relationship and so on from the classics. Now, I thought of Dante when the gentleman was asking about forgiveness. See, he had to take Virgil along to go into his own hell. And I think that if you put it in a, in a deep uh, form, that no person can face his own hell without some relationship, uh, without Virgil coming along. And this was, brings in very much uh, this forgiveness business. I think it's in every relationship, especially in the therapeutic. Not that we forgive in a cosmic sense, but uh, we realize the other person is human. Now, Dante, uh, got halfway through the Divine Comedy with Virgil there pointing out the meaning of things and uh, what various, uh, uh, why per various persons were in hell or uh, uh, purgatory. But then Virgil said, now I have to leave you. And to me that's a great example of uh, how uh, we can help people along um, and then uh, uh, Sooner or later, we do have to break the relationship. Now, Dante had a great transference to Virgil. He said, oh, my sweet father, don't leave. But Virgil said, uh, I have to. Virgil was reason. Uh, and now Dante goes on his own, but he makes a new relationship. And this was with Beatrice. And I think that uh, we've underestimated what, we, what uh, great help. Uh, the classics have for us in our own uh, psychotherapy. I just would like to say to the person who raised the question, perhaps a conference like this is in order to raise confusion. Uh, I think that it's out of confusion that we gain new insights. And uh, so I really wouldn't be concerned that you've probably been hearing various points of view, differing opinions, different uh, evaluations. In answer to your question, though, as to the goals of who sets the goals of therapy, for me, I, that is as clear as I can make it. I would not want to impose my goals on the client. And yes, I might do that unwittingly. I think that's where um, the value of recording interviews comes in, because one can see where you have let your own bias creep in, especially if you examine the recording months later. But it seems to me every choice of direction in the interview, every choice of what direction to take behaviorally, uh, is for me up to the client. I want to empower that person to be more of him or herself. And that means making the choices that seem real to them, the directions they want to move. I really trust the um, trust the constructive nature of the human organism to move in directions that will make sense for that person. And so, uh, though I may unintentionally influence that goal, basically I want it to be the client's own choice in the interview, in life, in every aspect that I can possibly give them that power. Uh. Well, uh, I was on the verge of saying that I agree with all of the panelists until Carl spoke. <laughs> uh, uh, I certainly completely agree with what uh, 
Virginia and Rollo said, and I like very much what they said, and Duvesi said it, since I don't quite agree with what uh, Carl has said, uh, let me add uh, to Rollo May's reference to Dante, which happens to be all of, also one of my loves. I believe that to achieve the kind of goal, now maybe Carl Rogers and I have the same goal, and that is to make the person authentic and liberate him. But I think we can only do this if we are more angular and less opaque. And I can certainly cite Dante in my support, because in Dante's Inferno, there is a particular place for people who are so bad that they don't even deserve to be in hell. They are confined forever to the vestibule of hell. And they are the people who, when the angels fought over what is right and wrong, decided to be neutral. No. I am most assuredly not neutral. I am on the side of the client. <laughs> Neutrality has not been a hallmark of this panel. As moderator, I would like to thank the participants and I would like to thank you as an audience. <laughs>